it's snowing pretty good outside. If you've been here like through Sunday school, things are covered again. And uh, intersections are slick. And when people run through the intersection and hit you in the side, it takes a little longer to get here. So we uh, had an accident right down here at the corner. And he said, well, where can we pull over? I said, let's pull over in the church down there. And so we pulled over and um, we exchanged things. And I said, listen, since we've run into each other, um, <laughs> let me invite you to come to church right here. <laughs> Never miss an opportunity. Uh, so, uh, I was going to say I'm okay, but then some of you know me. <laughs> and you know I've never been okay. So, I'm normal. No, that's not even right. But anyway, uh, quite an interesting morning getting to church this morning. And when you go home today, be very, very, very careful. It is pretty slick out there right now. So... Dale was a little concerned about me, and then he was concerned about Bruce if I didn't show up. So, <laughs> uh, Here's what I want you to do. Take a look with me in the book of 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter. Um, these are Paul's closing words in the first book he wrote to Timothy. Several years ago, uh, the Lord really led me to a study of closing words and opening words. Uh, you know how it is. They say that you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And so when you read the letters of Paul, I never want to take it for granted the way he opens his letter. Because there is some substance of meat that he has for the hearer, for the reader. And it's going to set the course for the rest of the book, whether it's a very short book or one of his longer writings. He sets the stage. So his words of greeting are worth hearing. But another thing that's always impressed me are closing words. Over the years in ministry, I've heard people give their final words to families. I remember my dad's final words to me. I remember my mother's final words to me. Never forget those. Uh, there's something about the, the final word that is something, at least in my life, that I grab hold of, and I just never will let go of that. Because that final word, even if it's unknown to the individual, that may be their final word. It's powerful for me. It's, it becomes life-changing for me. We, we should never take for granted our final words to those around us. And so the Apostle Paul, as I've read through his letters, his final words are powerful. Now, if you want to go past the Apostle Paul, look to Jesus. Jesus told his disciples he would not leave them or forsake him. And as he went back up, the angel said, listen, he's coming back. That's good news. Final words are powerful. And so as we're coming to the close of this year, I want you to look with me at Paul's final words, closing words to young Timothy. You may already know how precious Timothy was to Paul. How he literally took him under his wing and um, the discipler and the disciple together had walked through so much. And Paul's now pouring in these final words into to Timothy. I am one who believes strongly we should always be mentoring someone. And we should always still be being mentored. A leader is a learner. A learner is a leader. And we take that which God's given us and we equip it and we pour it into the life of others around us with intentionality. So today we look at his closing words. Next week I want you to look at his opening words as we look at 2018. And see what it is Paul says that we need to take hold of today. So these verses are not on the slide, but... You can follow along in the, your scripture, beginning in verse 11 through verse 16 of 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now you, man of God, 
run from these things. But pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and have made a good think confession before many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all and before Christ Jesus who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. The blessing and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Finally, verse 16, the only one who has immortality dwelling in an unapproachable light, whom none of mankind has seen or can see, to whom be honor and eternal might. Amen. Amen. Now here's what I want you to think about with me as we come to the close of this year. There's a lot of things that have happened this past year. For me this morning, I'm glad the accident waited to the last day of the year, and it's in 2017, not a sign of what 2018 is going to hold. But I want you to think back in your own personal life for what this past year has held, what it's looked like, where it's taken you, the joys, and the tears. The encouragement, as well as the discouragement. The known and the unknown. The embracement of love and the heartbreak of separation. In God's infinite wisdom, the scripture assures us that he takes all of those things what we understand and what we don't understand. He takes all of those things and he molds them, shapes them, works them together for his good. And even in the most painful of days in our hearts, God has shown himself still faithful, still on the throne, still in charge, still in control, in order that as I look back, I see his grace. As I look forward, I trust him and his faithfulness. So we come right at this pivotal point as Paul writes to Timothy, and I want you to see a couple of things with me, but I want you to think with me of how important it is we really consider what's before us, okay? Can I just depart from the scripture for a second? I was amazed at doing some research this week on some of the projections of 2018 of what's going to happen. I won't go into great detail on all these, but let me just mention a couple. Uh, in February of this year, we have the Winter Olympics to look forward to. And the world's attention will be in South Korea, just below a nation known as North Korea. There's going to be a wedding in May for Prince Harry and his bride, Megan. Megan, is it? See, some of you already know about that. They tell us that there's a company called the Moon Express, whose slogan is, the moon is me. I don't get that, I just read it. They plan on sending a landing craft with passengers to the moon in 2018. Get your tickets, I think they're going for about $100,000 or something, a couple hundred million maybe. But... Um, Midterm elections are going to be coming up this next year, and we'll have to listen to all of those commercials and opinions. And If you really want to take a trip but don't want to go to the moon, they're now flying a flight into Antarctica for the first time ever. You think it's cold here. <laughs> if where your heart is in the water rather than in the ice, for $100,000, you can board a submarine and sail down and look upon the Titanic take place in 2018. Do you realize historically that uh, 2018 marks the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I? It marks the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. Also in 2018 they tell us that artificial intelligence will reach a new high 
that they continue to excel in executing information. A thing called customer personalization, if it's not already more about the consumer than it is the quality. 75% um, of those who were surveyed said they prefer personalization to improve their shopping experience. Means the drone will be landing on your front porch with your goods. 2018 is going to be an interesting year because even though we scientifically advance, it seems that the need for personalization becomes more and more important. And so people are being drawn back to a sense of relationship. Gee, I wonder how the church could fit into that. There's also this need within our days, year before us, they say, where data will be reviewed, but it's got to be fresh. We thought things were coming at us fast in 2017. But people aren't going to want old news. They're going to want new, up-to-date, fresh-looking information. 2018 is going to be quite an interesting year. But where does that put us as the church? What are we thinking about what God has given to us that we will do with what's been put in our hands to go forward? Well, let's take a couple lessons from the Apostle Paul quickly in this passage we read just a moment ago in 1 Timothy. In the sixth chapter, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, I want you to understand that as you come to this time of transition, Back in verse 2, we didn't read back in verse 2, but he says, I want you to teach and encourage these things. Teach the things that I've given to you that you might have them deep within your heart. As I said before, you can't lead if you're not learning. God puts things in your life. He's taking you on a life journey for a purpose in order that the things you learn, you might give over to others so that you might equip and help others to walk in their faith that no matter what 2018 might bring for all of us, who knows, Jesus may come back. And we want to be ready, and we want to encourage others to be ready for such a time as that, that they might know Him. So Paul says to Timothy, first and foremost, you teach. Don't see yourself as just an absorber. See yourself as one who gives that which He's given to you to others around you, in order that they might know the hope that is in your heart can be their hope as well. So he says, teach. But look at these things he encourages us as we teach. Down in verse 11, first thing he says on that next slide, first thing he says to us is to flee. Down in verse 11, he says, now you run from these things. One of the things I hope happens in 2018 that discouraged my heart in 2017, we'll flee from stuff. By that I mean... We just kind of do the old Doris Day, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. And, and we're not that different from the world. We don't look that distinct to stand out from the world. We just kind of embrace everything and pat each other on the back. And, and I really think for many, we see God not as a just God, but as a God who kind of puts things in the scales. And maybe it tips against us, but God goes, oh, don't worry. I wasn't really serious about that. You're okay. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing. My goodness, everybody messes up. That's why we need a Savior who calls us to be different in the world, to be a holy and righteous people that walk in the light as He is in the light, and others might see in their darkness the hope that is found only in Him. How do you do that? When you flee from some things. One of my concerns in 2017 is too often in the church we're too comfortable with the surroundings that we're not supposed to be comfortable with. You maybe have heard the story of the eagle. When the baby eagle is in the nest, mama's there and the nest is warm. And the nest is comfortable. But do you know what mom starts doing as that eaglet starts to grow? She starts taking those comfortable feathers of hers that have fallen off and starts removing them from the nest. 
she starts taking the straw that they've rested upon and starts pulling it out of the nest. Exposes the rocks and the shells and the jagged edges. And the eaglet goes, Mama, this ain't too comfortable. And she says, well, we'll work on that. So she picks the little eaglet up and she pushes it out of the nest off the side of a cliff. And he begins to fall and begins to fight for his life. And she swoops down, catches him on her wings, and goes back up to the nest. Why? Because eaglets were never made for a nest. They were made to fly. You've got to flee some of those things that seem comfortable because it's a paralysis to the intended purpose God created us. And one of the things in 2017 is we need to flee from some things in our own lives, in our own attitudes, in our own hearts, in our own actions. And Paul writes to Timothy and he said, get away from those things. I mean quickly. There is no sin that's come upon you that Christ has not been tempted in. But the, he's also made a way for you to what? Escape. And sometimes that means run as fast and as far as you can. Don't mingle and linger. As a church for 2018, may we not become comfortable with where we are. May we strive and say, God, we flee from the contentment of I'm okay, we're okay. To a passionate heart that says, God, we want to be everything you've created us to be. Amen. You will call a pastor in 2018, correct? Shake head like this. I want to rejoice in 2018 to hear what great things God, God is doing right here through this body of believers in 2018 as you grow and walk in Him. Paul says you've got to flee from these things. But there's some things you run towards. You, you pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Running away does not mean abandonment into the unknown, un the darkness. It means pursuing into that which embraces, catches, and holds you as only He can do. And that His presence is living in your heart, that out from your life there's a demonstration of His glory. But there's a second thing I want you to see, not only to flee, but look in verse 12. He says to fight that there might be a fight within us. Now, I've known enough Baptists over the years, there's a lot of fight in us. Um, sometimes that's not always good. That's not the kind of fight he's talking about. Let me, let me put it this way. Are there not some things that you would fight to the death for? because it means more to you than your life itself. One of the best examples I can picture of this is a mother for their child. A mother will die for the life of their child. As a father, I, I will die to defend my family. There's some things I'll die for. Now, if there's a piece of dark chocolate laying up here on the communion table, and I want it, I might try to get it, but I'm not going to fight you for it. It's just not big of a, that big of a deal. You know what I'm saying? But every one of us ought to have something that we'll fight for. Here's the way I've always thought it. Until you have something worth dying for you really have nothing worth living for Amen. there had better be something so deep down in your fiber that that is what drives you to live do you know the apostle paul why he went through what he went through because he believed the gospel was worth fighting for you, you read some of the other books of his writings 
And you hear about those that turned against him or went the other way or whatever. You know what? It grieved his heart. But it didn't mean he compromised and said, oh, it's just a piece of dark chocolate. It's not that big a deal. It'll all be okay. That's not what he said. You need to, as you think about a year ahead, not only determine what you'll flee from, but what is it this year you'd, you'd fight for? I mean, to the end. You say, well, when it comes up, I'll think about it. No, you won't. It'd be too late then. You've got to give it some thought ahead of time. A friend of mine pulled this quote out, and I thought, boy, that's good. Kind of fits in here. You're holding a cup of coffee when someone comes along and bumps into you and shakes your arm, makes you spill your coffee everywhere. Why did you spill the coffee, is the question. Well, because someone bumped into me, of course. Wrong answer. You spo spilled the coffee because there was coffee in your cup. Had there been tea in your cup, you'd have spilled tea. Whatever is, listen to this, whatever is inside the cup is what will spill out. Therefore, when life comes along and shakes you, and it will, whatever is inside of you will come out. It's easy to fake it until you get rattled. So you have to ask yourself, what's in my cup? When life gets tough, tough and spills over, should joy, gratefulness, peace, and humility be present? Or do we find ourselves with anger, bitterness, harsh words, and reactions? You choose. You choose. Whatever's in is what comes out. So you need to think about some of these things in advance. The Bible says always be ready, always be set, always be prepared to give an answer of the hope that is where? In you. In order that you might know how to answer every man. If you're brought before judges and kings and rulers and they ask for you to give an account, the scripture says that you always should be ready, prepared, trained, and equipped to give an answer because you've already determined the fights. You think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel hadn't given a thought to what they would say if they were put on the spot? I mean, when tensions run the greatest, whatever's in us is what pours out of us. Always be ready to fight the good fight. So you've got to ask yourself, what will you fight? Then down in verse 13 next, he says, In the presence of God who gives life to all and before Christ Jesus, who gave a good confession before Pontius Pilate, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Things to flee, things to fight. Verse 13 tells me there's things to find. There's some things I need to find. I challenge you to pursue the things of God this year and find what it is he's saying to you and for you and hear him like you've never heard him before. Every year our office um, closes down. Some people think it's closed other times of the year, I guess, but we're officially closed down between Christmas and New Year's Day. few years back, one of the things I like to do during that time is allow the Lord just kind of lead me in a direction of something to read or study or some topic or whatever. Just a few years back, he led me over to First Chronicles. Boy, that's a yawner. I mean, there are times you read the Chronicles in order to fall asleep. If you look in the Old Testament, that's not unusual. Kings would in chart, couldn't rest at night. They would call for their readers to pull out the chronicles, the recordings, and read to them so they'd doze off. I know some people call those sermons, but they really weren't. Um, they were just writings that went on and on. As a matter of fact, King David was having a night like that, and they were reading through. And David said, is there anyone of Saul's household that still lives? Well, there is Mephibosheth. Bring him to me. It, that was out of the Chronicles. 
So the Lord led me to First Chronicles. Do you know what I came away? I'm not going to take a lot of time. Um, you know what the Lord led me to in First Chronicles? Uh, don't take this wrong, but this is the most men's man's book I've ever read in the whole Bible. I, I never comprehended what God says to a man out of First Chronicles. Now, I know ladies can get some things out of there, but I'm telling you, God took me on a journey through First Chronicles that week that I'm still not over. Powerful. I want you to find what God has to say to you this year that's powerful. And I want you to pursue it with a passion. And I want you to hear Him completely for what He has to say to you personally. Timothy, Paul says, Timothy, I want you to have the character of God. I want you to find that. I want you to pursue after that like you've pursued nothing else with intentionality. So, maybe the Lord's spoken to your heart already, speaking to your heart, reconfirming something. Maybe there's something He'll show you as you seek after Him. But I want you to find it in 2018. Because the world's going to go on. And the world's going to continue to spin. But all oh, that you might have a heart for Him. Find Him. And then next in our list, I want you to see that which is faithful. Oh, and the next slide. Then he's faithful. Look again in this passage of Scripture where he says to us in verse 20. We didn't read that one before, but I want to draw it as we draw it to a close. He says, Timothy, guard what's been entrusted to you. Don't take it haphazard. Don't let it just sit on a shelf and collect dust. Don't say there was a day, yeah, that, that was important. He says, guard, secure, pay attention, be attentive to that which has been entrusted to you. Avoiding irreverent, empty speech and contradictions from the knowledge that falsely bears witness and the name. By professing it, some people have moved from the faith. A ship drifts unless it's anchored. A life drifts unless it's anchored. Faithfulness is contrary to the nature of all of us. Because the Bible says we all have sinned and we all come short of the glory that is of God and that it is God. Therefore, in order to avoid and to remain faithful, I must anchor to Him. I must hold on to Him. I must cling to Him. And I must guard that with every passion that's in, within my heart, or I'm adrift. You've probably gone to the ocean. Um, I'm not a swimmer. I'm a rock. But we still would wait out in the water, and we'd just be standing there. And suddenly I would look up in all of our beach towels and chairs that were right there. Now suddenly unbeknownst to me, are down here. And I'm trying to figure out who moved them. They didn't move. I did. I must stay attentive. Or the currents of the world, the currents of the day, the currents of my heart, the currents of everything around me will cause me to go adrift. So I must constantly guard or I drift. And then he says that final phrase, not to be caught up in babblings and contradictions, but he says, grace be all 
Grace be with all of you. May you live, may you walk, may you be guided by God's grace. And I'm sure you've heard that little acrostic. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. What happens if in 2018 we thank the Lord for where we've been, where you've been, we entrust to Him the things that we still don't understand that happened last year. But we look forward to His faithfulness to continue to teach us and equip us in what's before us that we walk in His grace that's given for you and for me that I'm never the same because of who He is in me. One thing is for sure in 2018, things will change. It's kind of like a grinding stone, isn't it? It either grinds you down or it polishes you up. It all really depends on what you're made of. I pray that 2018 is year before us, where as we look back, we're guided by what is yet before us, the hope that is found in Christ alone and all that we do and say. Find you a Paul. Find you a Timothy. And equip them with the confidence of the gospel that it is our only hope in all that we do. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for a time in your word. Thank you for this day. Thank you for loving us as you do, being with us as you are, being before us as you ever will be. May our confidence and our hope be in you alone. As you speak to our hearts, may we just be obedient. Nothing more, nothing less, and nothing else. Guide us through today. Teach us to pray for those around us. I pray you will be with the gentleman that I met this morning and draw his heart to you. I pray you will ever keep me mindful of my neighbors and their life happenings, but also the hope that you have to give to them. I pray that you'll be with this congregation. May we ever be mindful that we ask your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And may that be true for this congregation as they march boldly into the year ahead. Thank you that your grace is always sufficient, I pray. So as you speak right now, the evidence we hear you and have heard you will be changed lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bruce will come and lead us in an invitation hymn. And I'll be here at the front if you would like to pray, seal the deal, kneel, nail something down that God's spoken to your heart about. But this is an invitation. It's an invite to respond to what God is saying and has said to you in our time together. Let's stand together and sing.